Hi, I'm Richard Vig with Tycos. We were gratified to get a lot of comments on our recent video on how money is created. We appreciate that. Today, we're gonna to respond briefly to three of these comments. So this will be a little more wonky than usual, but please indulge us. Clearly folks relish this topic. So here goes. One question came from Dr. Steve Keen, a friend and mentor who wrote, quote, I think you compress one step in the process too much. At three minutes and 34 seconds, you have John Smith buying a government bond directly from the government. In fact, as you know, the initial primary bond auctions are only open to banks or primary dealers via accounts they have at the Fed. This is money creation, but it can be reversed and in practice, as your data shows, is reversed by bond sales by private banks to non-banks in the secondary market. Well, Dr. Keene is right, of course, and we give our thanks to the inimitable Steve Keene. We did compress, as he suggests, for simplicity's sake. But to clarify, our focus is on whether existing deposits are being depleted to fund the initial purchase. Primary dealers, even when they are affiliates of a depository institution or bank, are not the depository bank itself. They fund the purchase using existing deposits and their clearing bank then settles the auction by crediting the Fed with reserves. That transaction, whether done by a non-bank financial institution or a household, reduces deposits at issuance, which to us is the key thing to understand. To be clear, we look at closing balances across sectors, which net all the deposit creating and deposit draining steps during the period in question. Put differently, we don't need to see every intermediate transaction to know the outcome. The closing balances tell us the net deposit creation. But kudos and thanks as always to Steve. A second great question, or should I say comment, came from Danielle M, who is also a friend and correspondent who wrote, quote, I love your video because finally I see someone using double entry bookkeeping, but Government deficit spending can create money, deposits, and increase M2. How? The Treasury issues bonds, say $100, but if the banking sector buys these bonds using reserves, the TGA account rises by $100. The government can spend and the money supply increases by $100. The so-called crowding out effect is a fairy tale. Furthermore, private commercial banks can create money when they purchase newly issued government securities as primary dealers at auctions by making digital accounting entries on their own balance sheets. The asset side is augmented to reflect the purchase of new securities, and the liability side is augmented to reflect a new deposit in the federal government's account with the bank. So our response is, Danielle, you're right. Your double entry read is spot on and helpful, and our group is Genuinely impressed with your detailed knowledge, we always enjoy your feedback. What Danielle points out is resident in our internal computations and in the video as presented, and we briefly addressed the scenario of banks creating money when purchasing treasuries in the video at about seven minutes, six minutes and 50 seconds into the video. You know, blink and you'll miss it. So our thanks to Danielle for pointing that, this out more explicitly. Didn't we tell you this would be a bit more wonky? But hang on, because there's one other question from another viewer that we will tackle today. In fact, we got this from a, a variety of folks, uh, all with some slight variation of the same question. That question is, isn't government debt itself money? And when the government issues debt, isn't that in and of itself money? This question is important because it gets directly into a widely held misconception about money, about printing money, and about the money supply. Frankly, government debt, on the one hand, and the money supply, on the other, get conflated by writers and commentators all the time. But they are two entirely different things. Government debt now totals $38 trillion and is just that, government securities, bonds, notes, and bills. The money supply is completely separate, and as we discussed, 
it is largely comprised of bank deposits plus currency, and the Fed puts this money supply, or M2, as, as we've mentioned it being called, at $22 trillion. But let's just pretend for a moment that government debt is money. Well, then the money supply would be the sum of M2 at $22 trillion, plus government debt at $38 trillion for a total of $60 trillion. And heck, if government bonds are money, why shouldn't Fannie Mae and Ginnie Mae mortgage bonds and even corporate bonds count as money? If I can buy something with a treasury bond, why couldn't I also buy it with a Fannie Mae bond? If so, that would add another $25 trillion of money, bringing the total to $85 trillion. But Treasury securities are not considered or counted as money, and the reason is simple. For something to be considered as money, it has to conform to a common-sense, straightforward definition. There's nothing mysterious, frankly, about money, no matter what period of history you look at it. Uh, it, it, money has to be regularly and widely used in payments for goods and services. And purveyors of those goods and services have to widely accept it as payments. Merchants generally don't take government bonds as payment for, say, a car or airline tickets as just two examples. Instead, if their customers want to pay using the value of a treasury bond that they own, they sell that bond and get a deposit in return and then use that deposit to purchase such things. I suppose in theory, merchants could take bonds as payments, and there might even be an occasion where somebody did, but in any commonly held definition of money, it's not whether they do in isolated circumstances, but whether they generally and routinely do. I would note there's, there's an interesting footnote to this. There actually was one period in U.S. history where U.S. Treasury debt was used as money. In the War of 1812, when the U.S. government's finances were in miserable shape, they let the First Bank of the United States expire and really had no resource for creating money. So in desperation, they printed some Treasury bills in very small denominations, some as low as $3, a $3 Treasury security, and paid suppliers with those small bills. That was a very short-lived exception, and it shouldn't surprise you that this was the one time in U.S. history when the government defaulted on its debt. Yes, indeed, the U.S. government actually did default on its debt in the War of 1812. However, in spite of everything I just said, today in 2025, there actually is a small sliver of Treasury bills that the Fed does consider to be money. And that is the portion that falls in the category of, quote, retail money market funds, which are funds largely comprised of short-term treasury bills, but can also contain very short-term high-quality instruments like commercial paper, uh, safe and highly liquid. But this is a small slice. Even if this total were all treasury bills, it only amounts to about $1.9 trillion of the $38 trillion in government debt and only 9% of the $22 trillion money supply. So why is this small slice of government debt considered money, you might ask? Well, for the very simple reason that you can access these funds with a checkbook or credit card or debit card. Or how in the world did that come about? Well, it came about early in my banking career in 1977, when Merrill Lynch, then the country's dominant brokerage firm, <clears throat> famously launched a money market fund-based checking account, terrifying bankers and shocking the world. This happened in May of 1977, and Merrill Lynch Products was called the Cash Management Account, or CMA. It allowed higher balance customers to automatically sweep idle cash into a money market fund and it provided check writing capabilities and included a credit card. There was a very famous headline that appeared at the time, I believe it was in Fortune magazine, that summed it all up, titled, quote, Merrill Lynch quacks like a bank, end quote. You see, the prime rate had reached 7.75% in that inflation-ravaged year, and short-term treasury bills were paying around 5 or 6%, 
but banks were paying 0% interest on their checking accounts because they were prohibited by the government from paying any interest whatsoever. That was a relic of a depression era regulation. So of course, consumers, households were clamoring to be paid interest on their checking accounts and Merrill Lynch, led by an ex-Marine and future Treasury Secretary Donald Reagan, introduced the CMA as an assault on the bank's historical turf. As mentioned, I was just starting my banking career at the time, and I can report that bankers freaked out and thought their tidy little world had come to an end. Well, instead, Merrill Lynch, Fidelity, and others to who introduced this type of account crabbed a small slice of the market and have since nestled into that niche. And this small slice of short-term treasury bills has been counted by the Fed as money ever since. Now, technically, the truth is, to make this work, Merrill Lynch and others had to partner with a bank because the checks customers wrote could only enter the banking system by using a bank's transit routing number, also called its ABA number, and using the bank's overall settlement and processing services. In other words, it was entirely dependent on the bank deposit system, but that's an arcane and technical point. In any event, those are our responses to three of the questions we received. I hope that helps. See you next week, and as always, keep the comments and questions coming. Thanks.